Okay, Hebrews, the glorious Jesus. Uh, this is lesson number two, entitled Jesus, Greater Than the Angels, part one, and we'll be in chapter one, if you want to follow along in your Bibles. Chapter one, beginning in verse uh, four. So the book of Hebrews, as I mentioned uh, last time, written to a particular group of Jewish Christians, who because of persecution were being tempted to abandon Christianity and return to Judaism. And in the letter uh, uh, to the Hebrews, the author appeals to them to remain faithful to Christ by showing them Christ's superiority to their former Jewish religion. And he does this by comparing Jesus to various elements of the Jewish religion. He compares Jesus to the prophets, he compares Jesus to the angels, to Moses, to the priesthood, so on and so forth. So in our last lesson we studied how Jesus was superior to the prophets because, there we go, because he was, he was superior to the prophets because he was preeminent in history. Remember last time I said to you Jesus was at the beginning because the world was created through him and Jesus is also at the end because when he returns the new heavens and earth will be uh, created. So he's at the beginning and at the end, but the prophets, where are they? Well, they're in the middle. So he's preeminent, he's above, he's superior to the prophets. He's superior um, in his nature, he has a divine nature. The prophets, of course, only had a human nature. Uh, he was superior in position, meaning uh, a position of authority. He's at the right hand of God, so he has authority that the prophets never had. They had a, the authority in the sense that they spoke from God and they spoke God's words, but they were never at the right hand of God as Jesus was. So that's kind of what we went over last time, how Jesus is superior to the prophets. In our lesson tonight, we're going to see another um, um, form of uh, comparison of Jesus. Um, and this time it'll be a comparison of uh, Jesus to the angels. But before we kind of examine the comparison that he does here in Hebrews, uh, we need a little background information about the angels themselves and what Jews thought about angels, um, because this won't make a whole lot of sense to you otherwise. Now both the Hebrew and the Greek words for angel mean messenger or messenger from God. Uh, the word angel in the Bible refers to an order of spiritual or supernatural beings not divine, they're not divine beings, uh, created by God who act as God's messengers to, uh, to men and uh, agent, uh, agents who carry out God's will among men. So here's some just a lot of just facts about them very quickly. Uh, they're spirit beings and they appear as men in Genesis 18 2. Uh, they never appear as women, in the Bible that is, they never appear as babies. Yet we see all kinds of caricatures, angels as women you know, or babies, but in the Bible they're never, they're never pictured that way. They were created by God, Psalm 148, one to five, Colossians 1, uh, 16 talks about that. They're not human and so have no sensual desire, uh, no desire to marry, so to speak, to reproduce. Uh, they're sometimes described as having wings. Isaiah chapter six talks about that, Daniel 9, 21. Um, they have intelligence and free will, which, uh, uh, you know, which is one of the reasons why they were in rebellion. They used their free will, but they used it obviously to rebel against God, 2 Peter chapter two. They were present and they rejoiced at the creation of the world. Job 38, verses 47, which suggests that they were created and they rebelled before the creation of the world. This is not something that happened after creation, it happened before the creation. Um, interestingly, there are no personal descriptions of angels, only descriptions of their order and their function. In other words, you won't go to a passage where it says, well, angel A said to angel B and they had a long conversation or, well, Michael the archangel, he's like this, he's a certain type of personality. You know, there's nothing like that in the Bible. The Bible only talks about what angels do, for example. So uh, another list here. Um, they have heavenly power or they're referred to as heavenly powers in Psalm 29. The holy ones, Psalm 89. 
um, as watchers, Daniel 4, uh, as a council or archangels, Psalm 89, also referred to as a congregation or a host, Psalm 82, spirits, Hebrews 1, uh, powers, principalities and dominions, Colossians 1.16, and in 1.16, powers, uh, principalities and dominions are referred to in the positive sense. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, powers, principalities and dominions, this time this, these terms are used in a negative sense to describe angels. Okay. Uh, Archangels, uh, mentioned already, 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, an interesting one is the angel of God or the angel of the Lord in Genesis 22. Uh, this is a special type for Christ. Remember we talk about types? Spoke about that in another series. Uh, types are like previews. You see previews of things in the Old Testament that preview, like the sacrificial system was a preview, a type. Uh, pointing to the sacrifice of Christ. Well, the angel of the Lord, the angel of God, a preview, a type of Christ. Christ coming in, in, in a certain form. Uh, some believe that the angel of the Lord is Jesus coming in the form of an angel. He, he, he came in the form of an angel in the Old Testament, comes in the form of a man in the New Testament. We also see that angels serve God in a variety of ways. Uh, as messengers to Abraham, for example, in Genesis 19, to Mary, Luke 1, uh, as destroyers, angel of death, the Passover, Exodus 12, as ministers, they ministered to Jesus in the desert, Matthew 4, and in the garden, Luke 22. Uh, they are worshipers, constantly praising God, Psalm 103. Uh, they are guardians of God's people, Daniel 12, 1, and of children, Matthew 18. We're not sure you know, how exactly that works. Simply we're told that that's what they do in some way. Now the Jews, they were familiar with the existence and the appearance of these supernatural beings throughout their history. The reason I gave you all this detail about angels, the Jews knew this history. They, they were familiar with what I've been talking about here concerning angels. The prophets spoke God's word and they did mighty miracles by God's power, but angels were the superhuman beings who were at God's throne and had appeared to various Jews throughout their history. So for the Jews, angels represented one of their closest experiences of divinity. Okay, that's why I give you all that information. If you were a Jew, living in the first century, angels were probably the, the, the beings that represented supernatural or divine power. Angels were it, okay? So in the first century, many Christians were confused as to how they should relate to Jesus. Is He only a man or is He only God? Some, especially Jewish Christians, may have been tempted to see Jesus as part of the angelic creation. After all, they were often sent by God as messengers and they did mighty deeds. So you, know, you, you couldn't fault them for thinking, well, maybe Jesus like, was an angel, like a very special angel. Okay? That idea would easily creep into the early church because of the long history the Jews had with angels. So the author of Hebrews firmly establishes the identity of Jesus as being greater than angels. He also shows how Old Testament passages are fulfilled in Jesus Christ and how these passages point to Jesus' superiority over the angels. Okay? So all this preamble I've given you is to set up the reason why the Hebrew writer goes to the trouble of demonstrating how Jesus is greater than the angels. Because for first century Jew, uh, it was easy to think that Jesus might just be an angel. Okay, so let's go to verse four. It says, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they, Hebrews 1 verse four. 
So remember last week we did Hebrews 1, 1, 2, 3, so now we're at Hebrews 1, verse 4. So the writer begins in verse 4 by making a summary statement concerning Jesus and angels. First, he says he's much better than angels. He's not an angel, he's much better than angels. Secondly, he has inherited a better name than they have. Now, as a man, Jesus was lower than the angels because he was confined to time and space. With his death and resurrection and accession, uh, ascension, however, he inherits a better name. Not name, my name is Jesus, my name is Peter, my name is Mark, not that name. Name as in position. You have a better name means you have a better position. He inherits a better position than the angels have. He inherits because the position was rightfully his. He created everything, so he deserves a better position. After all, the angels were created through Jesus. So he naturally has a higher position than them. It's a better position because it's at the right hand of power, not the angelic position. What is the angelic position? Well, it's the position of service. They serve. Jesus is at the position of power. He commands. So the author supports his claim with scripture about the character and position of the Messiah in relationship to angels. This position was determined long before by God and it was spoken of by the prophets. In other words, the Hebrew writer is saying, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not just making up the idea that Jesus is higher than the angels. The prophets said that when the Messiah would come, his position would be such. Okay? So he proves this point by referring to seven specific Old Testament passages that demonstrate the superiority of the Messiah in comparison to the angels. And here we go. Number one, Hebrews 1, 5a. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? That's from Psalm 2, verse seven. So here he refers to the enthronement of a king from David's line. On ascending the throne, the idea is that the king becomes God's son. Now, the scripture ultimately referred to the Messiah who would come from David's line, but would rule forever. Some of that information, 2 Samuel 7, 14 to 16. So the point is that God calls the angels as a group, He calls them as a group, sons of God. You know, in Job 1, 6, the sons of God presented themselves before God. The sons of God, plural, okay? But no one angel was ever referred to as the son of God, like the Messiah was called. You see his point? The idea of begotten is not birthing, like a woman births a child. The idea of begotten is enthronement. Set him at the right hand of authority. So the author starts by showing that Jesus, the Messiah, is greater than the angels because the prophets said that He would be called the Son of God, not a Son of God, not sons of God like the angels were called. He is greater because He is the Son of God. So argument number one. Number two, He's greater than the angels, so He quotes and says, and again, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. Second Samuel. So the passage comes from Second Samuel 7 and refers to the promise that God made to David through Nathan the prophet that God would provide for his son's efforts at building a temple in Jerusalem. So the point here is that the Messiah, who would be David's descendant through Solomon, would be like earth would be like earthly kings. He'd be a son, but unlike earthly kings, he would rule from heaven. And so he repeats the point that no angel was ever promised a thing like that by God, but the Messiah was, and Jesus is the Messiah. Right, in Psalm 89, verse 27, it says, I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So now the writer isn't arguing that Jesus is the Messiah. I mean, his readers already believe this. He's arguing that Jesus, as the Messiah, is greater than the angels according to Scripture, according to the Old Testament. 
just to make sure that even in our class we remember what, what I'm doing here, we don't get lost in all the details. He's giving seven different reasons why and how Jesus is greater than the angels and he's supporting all of these reasons with Old Testament scripture, which is the only scripture they had at that time. So number three, Hebrews 1 verse 6, he says, and when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Boy, if I was making this argument about Jesus greater than the angels, all I'd need is that one passage right there. Huh? Now this is a difficult verse because it could mean when Jesus returns again to the world as in His second coming, the angels will worship Him. The idea of the firstborn denotes priority and superiority all over all those who are born. Not the first one created. Jesus wasn't the first one created. Firstborn means among those who are born, He is the greatest as far as position is concerned. The quote here is from Psalm 97.7 and an exhortation that everything and everyone and every spiritual being must worship divinity. So the author um, raises the question to say that when Jesus was revealed as the divine Son of God, even the angels should worship Him as the scripture says they should of divinity. In other words, if, we should, if there's divinity and we ought to worship divinity, well then Jesus is divinity, then everyone, including the angels, should be worshiping Him as well. Jesus is not only greater, but also deserving of worship of the angels. So the, the again is usually seen as a literary device to introduce a new idea, and it should be at the, actually at the beginning. It should again, and when He, sa he brings. It's just where you put that word there, but it doesn't lose its essential meaning. And it's fairly clear. When he brings the firstborn into the world, that's Jesus, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Okay. Number four, Hebrews 1.7. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire? This uh, Psalm 104 verse four, the Old Testament idea that God used his angels as his servants. They were winds or they were flames, if you wish. Ezekiel talks about angels as flames. So the point here is that angels have no authority and at their highest, they're servants. They're supernatural servants, but nevertheless, still servants. In the next verses, he compares the authority of Jesus to that of the angels who are only servants. So we go to number five, Hebrews 1, eight and nine. It says, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is, in, is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Taken from Psalm 45, verse six and seven. Here the author describes the regal splendor of the position of the king. As Messiah, Jesus rules as the king in heaven. Unlike earthly kings, however, Jesus rules eternally. He rules with authority. You know when it says the scepter of his kingdom? That, that means authority. He rules with justice, meaning you know, when here it mentions he's righteous. He hates lawlessness. He rules with joy. It says anointed with the oil of gladness. So how does he rule? Not like an earthly ruler, not like a tyrant, okay? not like our modern, weak, human, sinful rulers. He rules eternally with authority and justice and in a joyful manner. And then it says, above thy companion, refers to the angels. He rules above them. So the angels in the Old Testament literature, they stood before the throne of God. So now the author pictures Jesus sitting on that throne and the angels worshiping Him. Number six, remember, seven arguments he makes from the Old Testament. Chapter one, verse 10 to 12, it says, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain and they all will become old like a garment and like a mantle you will roll them up, and like a garment they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come 
to an end. Psalm 102 is the passage he quotes here. Here in this passage he reviews the Old Testament description of the Son as the creator, all-powerful, eternal, preeminent, first and last. The point here is that the angels are not creators. They have no creative power. They are created beings and they are therefore inferior to the Son. Now in the previous verses, the author showed Jesus on the throne of the kingdom in heaven. Here he demonstrates that his rule extends over the physical creation as well. So he's ruler of all, ruler of heaven, ruler of earth. And then number seven, chapter one, 13 and 14 says, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? So this quote from Psalm 110, the author closes his argument concerning Jesus and the angels with an emphatic statement. He says, to what angel did God ever say? Just in case the first six passages have not convinced you yet. <laughs> One more passage. And he says, to what? to what angel did he ever say? And then he goes on and on. The image here that's described in this passage, the picture is of the oriental ancient custom of a victor putting his foot on the neck of a defeated enemy. They'd bring the the, the king who was defeated and they'd bring him forward and he'd be kneeling down and he'd put his you know, face down to the ground and the victor, the winning king, you know, would put his foot on his neck to show his superiority. Okay. Um, the writer, however, says only to his son, the Messiah, Jesus, does God offer the position of authority on the throne. And this position Jesus takes as all of his enemies will finally bow to him at the end of time. Doesn't Paul say pretty much the same thing in Philippians? Every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess. That's an interesting passage. You know? it, didn't say, it, doesn't say, it doesn't say all the believers, all the believers' knees will bow, uh, bend, and all the believers' tongue will, it says every knee will bow. That includes everybody the non-believers, the scoffers, the mockers, the disobedient, you know, and the believers, everybody, everybody will bend the knee and confess the name. The only difference is the believers have been doing this their entire lives. The non-believers, the mockers, the scoffers, they will be doing it. It's funny, it'll be the last thing they do before they go into eternal punishment. Kind of a scary thought when you think about it. Um, uh, he finishes the passage and says, you know, that's the position of Jesus. He'll, even his enemies will be you know, bowing down before him. But he says, but angels, well, they are servants of the Son towards the saints on earth. So you get a final picture of, cons uh, of contrast between the Son who has accomplished salvation and has returned to heaven to rule and angels who minister to the saved on behalf of the Son. So the, old, uh, the author uses Old Testament scriptures to demonstrate that as the Messiah, Jesus is greater than the greatest of the supernatural creatures that they have ever known, and those are, those are angels. So let's do a quick, I'm going to do the same thing, but you know, put it on a different, uh, a different graphic, okay? So he is greater because he's the son of divine origin and they are created beings. He's greater because he is the fulfillment of God's plan according to promise and they, they have no such promise. He's greater because as a divine being he is deserving of worship and they, the angels, they offer worship. As a matter of fact, whenever an angel appears to a human being, many times you see the human being kneel down or want to worship the angel and the, and the angels don't permit it. They won't permit anyone to, to, to worship them. Number four, he is greater because he has authority to command and they, they only have the free will to obey or to disobey. They can obey or disobey. 
but they have no authority to give commands. Number five, he is greater because he sits as king and they are merely servants of the king. Number six, he is greater because he created the world. They, on the other hand, are the created beings. And seven, he is greater because he saved men from sin and they only minister to men who are saved. Okay, there's, there's the whole argument in a nutshell. So in this section, the author establishes from scripture Jesus' higher position than angels. Now in the second part of this section, he's going to describe the significance of the work that Jesus did when for a time he accepted to be in a lower position than the angels. Do you see, the, do you see his dilemma, the, pro, the problem he, he's, he has here, the writer? He has to convince his readers that Jesus is higher than the angels. And yet his readers have only seen Jesus as a human being, lower than the angels. So he begins by giving them the spiritual vision of who Jesus really is, these seven arguments. Okay? In the next section, which I'm going to do next week, he's going to explain Jesus' role here on earth and how even while he was a little lower than the angels, he had a task to complete. But he has to do this first to fix in their minds who Jesus really is so that they'll be able to see in context what he's doing when for a time he did accept to take a position that was lower than the angels. Okay, we got that? All right, so let's do some practical applications just of what we've done, uh, just of what we've done tonight. Some, you know, just practical lessons, okay? Lesson number one, it's not how big your church is, it's how big your God is. You know, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, they deny the Bible's description of Jesus. Mormons teach basically that Jesus is one of many sons who eventually became God. He was a pre-existing spirit who became God, but you know what, eventually they teach, but all of us can, can reach the same thing. Jehovah Witnesses teach that Jesus began his existence as, well, as Michael the archangel basically believe him to be an angel, a superior angel. And with these teachings, they have built enormous followings with thousands of churches all over the world. Look at our church, look at our humble congregation, and compare it to the huge Mormon temples that are filled with people. And sometimes that you know, that can be discouraging. Their advertising is slick. Their zeal to spread their doctrines is powerful. I mean, boy, they, the men, they take two years off to go and knock doors. But don't be fooled by the size of church buildings or wealth or influence in the world. Their God is no God. Their Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus that the Hebrew writer describes, he's the one who's the Lord. He's the one who is the Savior. So let's not judge the value of a person's religion by size or by noise. You know the first question I ask somebody if we're about to study, I'm not sure where they're at. They just said they'd like to, you know, yeah, I've read the Bible. And yeah, I do believe in God. And yeah, Jesus and all that. And, so you know, you're thinking, where do you start? Teach them about the church? Teach them about baptism? Teach them about, you know, where do you start? I always start at the same spot. I start by saying, who is Jesus? Let's start there. Who is Jesus to you? Oh, wow, well, I don't know, maybe he's a prophet. You know what I'm saying? Because when I know, when, when, when I finally figure out who they think Jesus is, that tells me where they're at spiritually. So if they say, well, Jesus, he's the son of God. He's the divine being. He's the savior. He's resurrected. He died for my sins. Okay, <laughs> all right, let's move on. You know, are you saved? Well, you know, I don't know, I think so. Okay, next question. When were you saved? And how did that happen? You see what I'm saying? But I always begin with, who is Jesus? 
And I think you know, all, of, all of us should begin there when we're talking about religion. Because if he's not the Lord of the angels, well, he's not our Lord. Because the Bible says he's the Lord of the angels. It doesn't matter if a guy's got a $20 million church building, if he gets up and teaches that Jesus is an angel, it doesn't matter, he's got the wrong teaching. Lesson number two, Jesus is always more, not less. From the very beginning, there has always been an attempt to lessen who Jesus is. You know, in Mark 6, 3, didn't the people in his village say, is this not the carpenter's son? You know, the people in his hometown, hearing of his miracles, listening to his teachings, they remarked that he was, well, he's just one of us, country boy, son of a carpenter, making him less, attempting to make him less. The people said, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon, John 8, 48? The leaders accused him of being less than a good Jew and even demon possessed to explain his power to do miracles. Always trying to make him less. The people the Hebrew writer was addressing were tempted to see Jesus as part of the angelic beings that they had known, making him less than who he was. Various religions of the past and present have referred to Jesus as one of their own gods, the Hindus, for example, or a great prophet, the Muslims. They don't disrespect Jesus. The Muslims don't disrespect Jesus. Oh, he's a, he's a great prophet. But in saying he's a great prophet, they make him less than who he really is. He's the son of God. And the Hindus say, well, yeah, yes, he, he's one of the gods, one of the many gods, you know, well, yeah. They make him less by making him not only the only God, but making him one of the many gods. And modern philosophers view him as a moral teacher, a moral leader, a good man, an innocent man, one of the, the, the most striking characters in the history of mankind, you know? all of this stuff, but he's not the son of God. So they make him less, always making him less. But any description of Jesus that brings him down, even if it's down politely and respectfully from his exalted position, is inaccurate. You know, John says, John the, you know, the writer, he says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Second John 7, who's the Antichrist? The Hollywood version of Antichrist, a guy with horns and whose head twists around and he, he's red and is that the Antichrist? Some sort of Halloween character? John says the Antichrist is the well-dressed, very intelligent uh, 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 preacher, uh, uh, speaker, who begins to describe all the ways and means and reasons that Jesus is an angel or Jesus is simply a prophet. If, he doesn't if he's talking about Jesus and teaching about Him and teaches anything other than the fact that Jesus is the divine Son of God, John says, that's the Antichrist. John warns that the main deception will always be to deny the divine human, the, the divine slash human nature of Jesus. Either they bring him down as not being divine or make him only human or make him only divine and not human. It's always playing around with that equation. The apostles taught that Jesus was God. Nothing less than this, John 20, 28. So any teaching or suggestion that is different than this, it's not biblical. John even says that teaching of this nature is part of the power of the Antichrist in the world then and today. So the lesson, of course, and there are only two, I always give three, but there's only two. <laughs> Jesus is always more than what we think of or imagine, never less, never less. Let's remember that. Okay, so that's the basic beginning argument that the Hebrew writer makes about Jesus being greater than the angels. Next time we're going to do the second part of his argument and keep charging through the book of Hebrews, a great book. 
very, very, uh, very, very satisfying book because it, it exalts our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I think that's very important. All right, thank you very much.